All right, everybody, welcome. So now we are here, we are screen sharing. You're not gonna get to see my wonderful face, but get to uh, get to look at the screen share. So we'll give everybody a second or two to log on here. Hopefully everybody will rejoin us. I'm just gonna be patient. I think it's gonna take a minute for everybody to get back on here. Mm -hmm. Somebody that has already said the word dongle since the broadcast has started. All right, we're back. Can everybody see what's going on? There's Eric. All right, guys, welcome. Cool, well now I don't have to be as self-conscious about what I'm doing with my eyes and my face and everything, so this is nice. Awesome, all right. So we're here on the home screen of the Apex app. This is uh, how it's formatted on an iPad. You can see the icons are a little bit smaller on the larger screen view. Um, so you guys probably noticed that, uh, you guys probably noticed that there's some updates on the most recent um, Apple um, or iOS version. Hey, there's Robbie. Oh, hi, I like that. How you doing? Welcome. All right. So a couple things uh, to take note of on the on the new update here. We've got the the probably most um, obvious thing here is the crew view live feed at the bottom. This is going to display uh, display our friends that are that are online, people that we're following. Think of this like Instagram. Um, we can select uh, people to follow. Um, people can follow us, and we have to approve our followers. Um, so you can see here, I've got some suggestions for people to follow. So we can go in and follow Adam. Now, if you see a um, if you see a follow request from iDrive Fast, that's the profile name for our iPad here. So this is the Apex uh, the Apex iPad. So I'm going to follow people. So now, if you uh, accept our follow request, I'll get a notification every time you are on CrewView. Every time you are on a device that has access to cellular data that is sharing labs. Um, so now it's going to be kind of more of a friend centric. If we want to search our followers, you can tap up here in the bar and search people that are following you. Also for, to search the entire list, just tap in search all crew view users and we can go through the whole list of people here. Um, so if you don't know someone's username, best bet is just to enter into all crew view users there and uh, you can search for people to find. So we've got a lot of folks on here. Really appreciate everybody participating. This is absolutely awesome. Um, you do have to be on the newest app in order to access this. So if you're like, hey, my friend's at the track, they're broadcasting laps, I can't see them, make sure that they have their app updated to the latest version. I would highly recommend having auto updates on so that you don't miss um, an update or something like that on the app. Um, I can show you how to do that another time. I'm not an Apple genius, I'm just an Apex genius. Um, so we'll go into that later. Um, now we'll go into some data. I, uh, again, I had this data session emailed to me from Eric Meyer. It's at National Corvette Museum. I'm sorry, there's a couple other things right before we get into that. We reorganized this first row up here. You can now see from left to right, connect, calibrate, drive. Hopefully that's a little more intuitive. We'd love feedback on that. Um, and then all the display settings now are down on the third row. Um, so everything that affects the way the device is displayed. So we're just trying to organize it differently to make things more obvious. And then the data tab is right here, the data button is right here in the middle of the screen. So we're gonna tag that, um, and we're gonna look at this data from John Alfini from uh, the National Corvette Museum. And uh, John was in a Porsche 911 uh, with Aero, and was turning some really strong laps here. Uh, so we're gonna tap here, and again, the way we share it, just because we can't emphasize this enough, is to swipe right to left and tap share. So Eric just went in and tapped share, and that sends an Apex data file. Now to send a track attack, we'll tap export. That's gonna format the file as a CSV to upload it into track attack. Um, so that's something we can do as well. And then notes, uh, I'm gonna tap that, and the reason I'm gonna tap that is because you'll notice, so I'll, I can go in here and I can add, you know, what this driver was driving, I can add what the weather was, maybe it was, you know, overcast and, you know, 75 degrees. You can change, you know, notes about the setup of the car or whatever. Now, when I tap OK, those notes are going to stay with that data session. So when I share that data session to someone and I tap share, if I email that to someone else, those notes are going to live with that session. Um, I would highly recommend you doing that before you send your data to someone. And that, that way, 
all that that person has to do to see information on that session is right there, right? They can go, okay, this is the type of car, this is whatever details you feel were important, um, and there's your motive for, for sharing your data. Um, that's important. Awesome, so now to access the session, obviously we're gonna tap the session here, and then we're gonna get our GPS overview. So um, something, and again, I'm just gonna kinda go, go through this process as I would normally, pretending it's my data, um, but this is gonna kinda be just an impromptu coaching session for this driver's data. Um, so National Corvette Museum Motorsports Park. Now the first thing we're gonna do, I usually start on this screen, on the GPS satellite screen, and we're gonna, you know, it takes a couple of laps for the apex score metric to get built up. And by that, I mean, we have to create a baseline um, with our driving for our algorithm to understand something about the limit. Um, now, the best way to kind of think about how the device is learning the limit is it's using the accelerations that you're giving it by driving. Um, it's, in, it's populating that into a GG plot, basically. And then the algorithm is attempting to define the outside edge. And I'm gonna give us a visual here by, by looking at, at this plot right here. So we can see all those blue points. Basically what the device is doing is, is trying to identify where is it possible for there to be data points on the outside of this edge. And it does that with some information that it already has ahead of time. Uh, and then obviously the nine axis accelerometer and the 10 hertz GPS, those are what uh, are taking in the data points. But the reason this model is as robust as it is, and, I'm, and I can't emphasize this enough, it's super important, um, is that the nine axis IMU has the capability to understand if the track is cambered um, positively or negatively, if the track is going uphill, if it's going downhill. Um, with a nine axis IMU, it's essentially three three axis sensors. Um, they're able to understand those things through the data filtering that we do. So what's proprietary about Apex, what's different about us, is that we were able to actually teach machine learning the differences between those things. So now we can actually produce a model that understands uphill and downhill and how grip is affected by elevation change and all the different things that happen while you're on the track. And that's what makes Apex so intelligent. So all it's trying to do is constantly identify the outside edge of the circle. And we know um, if you think about something like GSUM, GSUM is basically you know, the sum of the Gs. It's basically saying, hey, here's your maximum G, um, which is very relevant in a lot of ways, but the reason the Apex score metric is different is because it recognizes that your maximum G is not always achievable. And that's what it's trying to give you feedback on. So now to jump into the analysis part, a lot of times I'll start with a speed trace. Um, if I know that this is a pretty quick driver, they're not leaving a ton on the table, this is usually where I start. Um, and there's some basic things we can look at um, while we're not even, oh, I've got the mouse. So I can use the mouse on it. This is new to me. This is cool. Look at that. Um, so a couple things that we can look at immediately on the speed trace. Um, obviously, when we see like a little plateau like this, that's usually an upshift. Um, that's important to note. This right here is going to be relaxing of our throttle, per throttle position, right? That's probably adjusting uh, our speed maybe in a, in a higher corner. This right here is interesting because what this tells me, this long downward trajectory, that tells me that's a hard braking zone. This looks like a smooth relax off the gas pedal or some coasting. So there's a couple of places we've already uh, identified that, hey, that, that could be problematic, right? Um, so what we need to know on the track, the things that are important to know on the track uh, that I always use on the speed trace to identify a corner on the track that we can work forward from, this is gonna be that really, really tight left-hand corner at NCM, all right? Now what I'm gonna do on the screen is I'm gonna zoom in and I'm gonna place my clicker there on the slowest part of the track. Now I'm going through this process as if, as if I don't know the track at all, so I'm trying to learn the layout while we're doing this. I'm gonna tap my clicker, my crosshairs, you can see it there, on this slowest part of the track, and then I'm gonna scroll back to this screen, and I'm gonna press play. Oh, I'm sorry, that didn't work. Let's do, let's do it this way. I'm gonna move forward to the, the corner I think is the slowest, which is gonna be this one, which in fact is our slowest corner. And now I'm gonna go back to the speed trace. There we go, that's what I was trying to do. So start on the GPS screen. So now we now kind of working forward, we know that this, this uh, sharp, you know, lowest speed corner right there, well, it's this corner right here where the car is. So now the speed trace makes a lot more sense. We can kind of work forwards and backwards from there. All right, very cool. So that's some stuff we need to know about the speed trace before we even go any further. 
Um, the speed trace really gives us more visibility once we start overlaying laps. So something I'm going to do here, and Eric sent me some information about this data prior to the prior to our session here, but um, I actually don't have my phone with me now because we are also live on Instagram with my phone. So I'm just going to kind of have to fly by the seat of the pants, which is even better for the content. So something that's important to know before we get into analyzing our LEDs, which is right here on the right, is we want to give the device a couple laps to learn enough for the information to be relevant. So I like to actually pick a lap after the fast lap. So usually the fastest lap after our fast lap is going to be one of the best laps to review uh, how much grip we're using with the apex score metric um, or what's displayed on the LEDs, which is, you know, the light bar right here. So I'm going to select the very next lap. Even though it's over a second off our slowest lap, right, we can assume that the driver is doing roughly the same thing, right? There might be some subtle variations, but I'm doing this on purpose. I'm doing this because I want the information from that fastest lap logged in the device. I want the device, you know, that's probably, if that's our fastest lap, that's probably where we were using most of the tire. And now the device has some understanding of, you know, where, where that limit actually is. So what we're going to do here is start at the beginning of the lap and just press play and look at the right side of the screen here. I'll use my mouse again. This is the play button right here. So I'm going to tap play and that's going to replay our dot going around the track. You'll also see the lights moving and then we'll also see our speedometer. So it's very easy for us to identify where we're transitioning from throttle to brake because we're going to see the lights move and we're going to see our speed decrease when we start to apply brake. All right. So I'm going to continue around the track. Now what we want to look for on our lights what we're primarily trying to identify and look for is red lights in the middle of the corner. But it's also important to remember that the progression of the lights, the progression at which the green lights overtake the red lights is just as important. All right, so right now we're looking at this corner right here. Um, so NCM, this is one. We've got our little kind of bus stop style chicane. And then we're coming down here into turn three, I believe. You can correct me on the uh, the corner names. This isn't a track that I'm super, super familiar with. I've done a lot of data review, um, and I've done some laps with Matt Busby, who's the man, uh, which is tons of fun. Um, so now as we accelerate here, this is going to be a corner where the vehicle is very traction limited. All right, so in a higher horsepower car, we could easily be spinning the tires right here. So using our apex lights is very important. You don't, the apex lights, that red that we're seeing could represent um, oversteer or understeer, or it could also mean that we're not at the limit of the tire. So the way to think about how that works um, is not over the limit or under the limit, as you hear people say. Um, basically, the limit is the limit, and it's the limit because you can't actually go over it. So when you are, quote unquote, over the limit, you're actually under the limit, right? Like you're not attaining maximum acceleration. You're not attaining maximum grip utilization with the tire. Therefore, you're under the limit. So just think about it like that. A lot of times if you see all green lights very quickly transition to a quick movement of red lights, that's oversteer. And we can check that in our speed trace. Um, we can see that with, you know, uh, lateral and longitudinal G, particularly lateral G. Um, we're not going to get into that today because we're, this is enough information as it is. Um, but maybe in the future, something I would really like to cover would be how we can pinpoint oversteer with lateral G. Um, we're not going to do it today. Like I said, that's, that's a whole different thing. But let's again watch the progression of the lights. Now I'm moving the ticker right here. This is an important tool that we might not explain enough, right? I'm mo actually moving this ticker right here with my finger to move the car around the lap. So the first thing I'm going to look at into this corner, we're at constant acceleration, constant acceleration. Watch our speedometer. We're still accelerating. So that red right there is just the vehicle not accelerating at its maximum. That means we're flat on the floor. Now, as soon as we transition to braking, watch the lights. So the driver actually did a very good job of immediately transitioning from gas to brake right there. So now we're on the brakes, we're on the brakes, we're on the brakes, we're on the brakes. See that one red light? Now we've all of a sudden not totally optimized our transition into the corner. All right, we probably are under slowing or over slowing. So next time we can either move that braking zone a little bit closer or we can start releasing brake pressure maybe a tad earlier. Remember, brake release is key. So something to really think about that Ross Bentley really talks about a lot is to identify your end of braking zone in the corner and kind of start to work backwards, all right? Work backwards from your end of brake to identify where we need to apply the brakes, okay? 
So now let's assume we are rolling off the brake pedal and back to throttle, okay? And you can see that by looking at the speedometer. So our minimum corner speed is gonna be 48, right there. Solid apex, looks like good position on the track, 47, I'm sorry. So we're actually past the apex on our minimum corner speed, which to me says that that red dot right there might actually be understeer. All right, now that I've looked at this corner enough, my thought on this corner would actually be back it up a little bit because I'm thinking this is understeer right here. Right there, all right? That's because we have a late minimum corner speed. Minimum corner speed's too late in the corner. That means we didn't slow down enough initially. Does anyone have any questions about? Does that mean past the slip angle? Eric, yes, yeah, sorry, I just missed that. Past the ideal slip angle. What Eric's referring to is every tire um, has an ideal slip angle. The stickier the tire, the less slip angle it's happy with usually. So a lot of times oversteer, understeer, underutilization of the tire, like I was saying, means we could be past the slip angle at which the tire is its happiest. So let's say seven degrees is the slip angle our tire prefers. If we see an oversteer situation, again, we're under the limit, we're past the slip angle that the tire is happy, we're not utilizing. The best way to think about it is we're just not utilizing what's available. So now we're accelerating. So now what we're trying to do is, with a lot of steering input still in the car, apply the power. Now this is probably a traction limited car. So very, very important to use these lights and, and review this on corner exit. So what this is telling me right here is the driver more than likely can squeeze to power a little bit more assertively here, all right? And that's still a constant radius corner. So that's a, that's a place to really play around with, but I would really spend more time looking at the corner exit there. All right, so I feel like we've kind of exhausted that, but the reason I wanted to really go into detail there is just to expose what we're looking for. And again, my hand, my, my finger is still on the ticker right here. So I'm using the ticker to progress the lap so I can move it at whatever speed I would like. All right, now we're approaching a higher speed corner. So something I'm gonna look at through here, I'm gonna pause the lap again and I'm gonna stop. I want a little more resolution on this. So I'm actually gonna go over to the speed trace, but just remember that's where the car is on the lap. Now what I'm gonna to do to figure out if I'm leaving something on the table is I'm gonna overlay a second lap. So I've got this lap selected with the blue check mark. Now I'm gonna press and hold my fast lap. You'll see it up here on the screen. There we go. Now I'm gonna move over to my speed trace. So this is where we're looking on the speed trace. All right. Now what's interesting here, let's start at the beginning. This is distance versus speed. So distance versus speed. All right. So this is breaking into the very first corner. Or, or I'm sorry, yeah, breaking uh, past the start finish. Now where we where we are right here, I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't show the full story. That's my fault. Right here, we are uh, where we are on, on the lap. Right? We're accelerating towards that fast turn five, which is gonna be this right here. What's interesting to note here, I'm gonna zoom back in. All right, what's interesting to note is that our blue lap, all right, which is our slower lap, we got a much better run, all right? We shifted earlier. See that little dip right there? That's a shift. We got an earlier shift. There we go, Adam, thanks. Turning in too early, yeah, absolutely. So what, what Adam's saying right here in the comments um, is that this driver probably didn't late apex enough, so he probably added his steering input a little too early. So the feedback we would give the driver from basically from what we're seeing, even without having steering position, we kind of can make that assumption. All right, so that's, hey, try a, a slightly later turn in, or maybe it's slow your rate of turning. Something that, um, that we can go into a lot more detail about that helps us utilize the grip is the wheel rate, the, the rate at which we turn the wheel. So we could actually slow the driver's steering input um, down a little bit, and that would achieve uh, a, um, a later apex in that corner. All right, so now we're at wide open throttle, and we can see that acceleration now. But look, what's, what's really interesting here is look how much faster our minimum corner speed was on the blue lap. And look how much earlier we were on the power. We can assume that was a later apex, and we got back on the power earlier. All right, significantly earlier, 20, 30 feet earlier. You can see that difference right there. So that's what we're looking at, difference, higher minimum speed, and to power earlier. That's why we're faster down the straightaway. What's also interesting here is that we slow down a lot sooner. All right, so that's what I wanted to see. So what is interesting is these are just two laps 
these two laps, our own laps that we could look at on the speed trace and learn something. So what we want to do is emulate in our fast lap, if we were able to piece together what we did on our slower lap, this whole section would already be that much faster. And that's essentially what a predictive lap timer is doing, is it's taking um, these different sectors and it's noticing that this actually was a better sector on our slower lap and it pieces those ideal sectors together and shows you what that total time is. All right, so now what we're gonna do is go forward from this point. We can also replay the lap here so you can see the crosshairs moving. And again, that's the tool that we use. Now I'm gonna deselect my first lap and we're gonna continue analyzing the second lap because the value we want to analyze now is apex score. Everybody watch this middle ticker right here. So the way we move these tickers is we slide it up and down and we can select um, what we want to be displayed. So I'm gonna keep it on distance and speed. These two control our, axi our axes. So the, the first one is the x-axis, the bottom axis, the middle indication here. Oh, the mouse got really big, you'll see that. Um, the second one is the y-axis over here. Then the color actually changes the coloring of the line itself. So I can change that color to red as well. I don't know, just maybe like red better. Or we can color it by another variable. All right, so now I can actually color speed by apex score. So now we can see, see the drop in apex score there? That's a shift, right? That's why we have red. That's off throttle, back on throttle. All right, this is probably a PDK car because that is a really quick shift. All right, a lot of times on a manual shift car, you'll see a more of a up, flat, up again um, when you really have to, a theoretical best. We can talk about that later, Adam, uh, in, and keep the questions coming, guys. This is awesome. Um, and so in this software on the app, no, we can't build a theoretical best lap. We just haven't built that functionality into it. Um, on, honestly, there's a ton going on right here, but keep giving us that feedback because the only way we make changes to what we do is is because people ask for it. Um, so if that's something that you want uh, to define sectors, build a theoretical lap, absolutely. So let's look at the braking here. So this is a um, braking for a fast corner. And we can see a lot just in the speed trace, but it's cool to have it covered by apex score because look at this deceleration. All the way down here, we're seeing yellow. All right, all the way. Now, apex score is basically the grip, right? So even though in a faster corner, we're not going to be maximizing, you know, we're not going to transition from wide open throttle to, to mat the brake pedal, right? We're just slowing the car down at a slower rate to keep it balanced through the corner. We still want this to be green. If we were to put, you know, a, um, a super, super fast driver in the car that was super comfortable in this corner at the limit, uh, there would be a little transition here where he came off the gas and went to brake and apex score would be red, but this would immediately be a lighter or, or, or more of this color. This is where the car is really loaded up in the corner, but on the entry to the corner, right, he's really not maximizing it. And we can see in the speed trace some indecision right here. All right, see these little blips? That's decelerating. Oh, releasing the brake a little bit. Decelerating again. Oh, releasing the brake just a little bit and decelerating again. Now we're starting to finally get our actual brake release in until we get down here. So we actually might have gone back to power just based on the curvature of the speed trace right here. All right, that is totally possible somewhere in here. All right, let's go look at it on the, and again, this is just a speed trace, but it's colored by apex score. And we can also color it by other stuff. So if we color it by speed, you know, the further up on the Y axis, the more green we're gonna see. We can also color it by longitudinal acceleration. So accelerating is gonna be green, decelerating is gonna be yellow, but see how cool this is? We can see our decelerate compared to like somewhere close to our maximum deceleration, right? It's gonna be red. Uh, we can also color it by lateral, lateral G. That's left and right. All right, I'm gonna go back to our GPS screen. So now you can see where the car actually is on the track. This is something that I, really, um, really enjoy using because now we know what the curvature of the speed trace looks like. Remember, we're going to be decelerating and then we can see it still colored on the track here. The driver's going to decelerate initially. This is maybe a moment of confidence. Hey, I think I can, I think I can make it through the corner. Then decelerating again, right? And, and really underutilizing the grip. So we get to the point right here where we're at 70%, 71% on our apex score. 
So right here at the tightest part of the corner, we're mm -hmm. not utilizing all the grip. That tells me immediately there's a big problem in this corner. Now, we can watch the light progression. I'm going to press play. We can watch the light progression all the way through the corner. Watch the light bar. You see a blip right there? All right, let's watch that again. I'm assuming we're on the intermediate setting here. So two things that have popped out to me through watching the lights in this corner. And the first one is our initial release of the brake pedal right here. Look how when we're adding steering, this is right on our, you know, after the car's loaded up mid corner, that means dramatic over slowing. Look at that. All right. Now also right here, we're seeing something similar. What we should, we should never see the lights be this inconsistent, right? What we should see is red lights at wide open throttle. And then here's actually what's more important in this corner. We'll get to this in a second. But what we should see ideally is the lights go from something that looks like this to green. And then we should see green lights sustaining or very, very near the edge all the way through here. Now we notice we've got one transparent light here. What that's telling us is that there's somewhere on the track that that, is, that amount of grip is actually achievable. Right now, that's not achievable based on the current conditions in this corner, on this part of the track. All right, the big problem in this corner, before we actually even add our steering input, is right here. See this part of the corner? This is what I'm highlighting right here. All right, so we're at wide open throttle here until we transition to braking, and we can see that braking by grip utilization. So we know we're going to see red lights on the straightaway, right? That's an assumption we have to have when we're wide open throttle in order for all this to make sense. Now we're transitioning to brakes and we can tell that because we see speed decreasing. Look what happens with our lights. This right here is releasing the brake pedal. So the driver's like, oh, okay, I slowed down enough. Now they're releasing the brake pedal. So going back to the speed trace, something that's important that helps us uh, analyze this is that a fast corner so this is our minimum corner speed right here. A tick over 97 miles an hour, right? 96, 97 miles an hour. Super fast corner. Super, super fast corner. So in a fast corner, what is what a, what a fast corner is supposed to look like? Oops, sorry, I'm missing these comments. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read the uh, read the comments for a second. Uh, to answer Ben's question, I'm not really sure what you mean by in the zone, but yes, when you do, when you go into transients, um, like if you change direction or if you, uh, you know, shift from throttle to brake, you will see underutilized grip represented by red lot dots that you'll never get to actually utilize just because it's that transition, right? It's, it's kind of inevitable. Um, Adam, how does it calculate the transparent dot? Um, so the transparent dot and what he's talking about is this right here. And you'll see that that will change depending on where you are on the lap, all right? So right here, that's, that grip is not available. And what that's basically telling us is it's a, it's a combination of everything that the APEX score actually measures. So think about it as a combination of, um, of speed, of lateral and longitudinal G, and of pretty much accelerations in nine different axes. So it's taking into account um, you know, the, grip, the grip formula that it's, that it's developing um, to display that to you. So in a heavily banked corner, usually the most banked corner on the track, that's basically the only time we're gonna see where those are available or a corner where it thinks that the grip level is, is similar. Um, and that changes based on speed as well. Um, and it is actually having to model uh, some, this is opening a little bit of a can of worms, so it's super interesting. It actually uses speed to help model your car's aerodynamic, um, you know, uh, just characteristics. What does your car do? How does, how does the grip change? And correlated, correlated to speed, right? Because there's over 60 miles an hour or so, um, arrows going to make a lot more difference. So in this corner, actually, arrow is a big part of the of the formulation. And this car does have some arrow, which is why we can see, I mean, a minimum corner speed of 95 plus miles an hour is huge. And I know that turn five right here, 
is a is a fast 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 corner but most cars we're seeing 70 to 85 miles an hour most cars that i've done data analysis here um all right we'll go back to the speed trace but yeah hopefully that that, that gets you there eric without going in too much detail and losing anybody um i'm sorry not eric adam so what we're looking at here in this now that we've looked through this whole corner this little bump right here is the whole issue right that's that is the problem that is uh what we need to get rid of on a fast lap we want this to just be a continuous u not a w right a continuous u down to our minimum speed um now does anyone want to comment on uh on why we want to see a u-shaped speed trace for a fast corner I know it's, so this is a v-shaped speed trace this is a slow corner fast to slow any corner that's basically under 60 miles an hour roughly uh, this is a little bit dependent on car and everything else, but it should look like this, right? Steep deceleration followed by quick turning of the car. This quick, you know, V-shape means that we added a, lot, a, a good amount of steering input and turned the car relatively quickly and got back on the gas. The shallow deceleration slowly reaching our minimum corner speed, that's more characteristic of a fast corner. Now, this is something we want to avoid. Now, what's important to remember, and I've actually selected to the wrong lap, so forgive me for that. Now this looks a little bit better, um, but it is important actually to go look through all of our laps and look for the shape here. All right, so if this is your data, I would definitely spend time doing this and maybe overlaying multiple laps. So I'm sorry, I actually had the first lap selected, but that's definitely a problem. All right, so we're gonna go back to the lap that we've been analyzing, which is this one right here, lap number three. Again, we're analyzing this lap because our apex score metric is going to have plenty of time to have been, been built up. And uh, I'm reading comments again. What do the colors mean from off break to exit for turn five? All right, let's talk about that. So Eric's asking about our brake release to corner exit of this corner. So brake release, all right, it's going to be somewhere in here. Let's go back and watch when our speed starts to stabilize, right? Right about here, so we're releasing the brake. And then corner exit is right here. So this is when it's most important. Now, I wanna, we wanna analyze the colors all the way from our initial entry all the way through the corner. And again, this part of the track immediately is what gets my attention. All right, we see this uh, yellowy orange um, situation there. That's telling me something happened there, right? That's probably a hesitancy to go back to throttle because we weren't really comfortable with our entry speed. Also, we can see this yellow strip here, right? So what it means on, on corner entry, and watch the red lights. We're gonna to transition to braking, 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 and about when we see that yellow dot right there, that yellow strip, that's when the driver's gonna be coming off the brake pedal and going back to throttle. And the reason I know that, how do I know that, is probably the next question, is because that's a transition in Apex score, a transition in the lights. And anytime we see a quick transition in lights and have something pop up like that, that means we went from one pedal to the other or we shifted the weight in the car. Does that make sense? So the weight shifted in the car from being over the front axle, in this case, to the rear axle, going back to power. Now, fundamentally, something Eric and I spent a lot of time talking about, fundamentally, this is probably too late, in our opinion, to go back to throttle in a high-speed corner. I know the apex is somewhere around here, right? In a high-speed corner, we want to transition to throttle fairly early, right? Anybody not following or anybody disagree? Fairly early, before the apex of the corner, right? So we should be back to power somewhere in this state. Now, what this little blip right here shows me is that the driver tried to go back to throttle, right? They got off the brakes and wanted to go back to throttle, but they didn't have enough confidence, and that's what caused them to continually over slow, right? So they actually went back to throttle well before the apex, right? And that was too early. So in a fast corner, we're usually gonna be back to the power before the apex, but now that I have all my thoughts together, what that yellow strip right there is indicating to me is that we're going back to throttle too early, and then we're waiting again, and then we're committing to throttle. So what I would, ask the driver to do next time is just to wait like be more patient and then go back to throttle when you're confident that you can get back on the power 
right? That's a really simple thing to just go out and attack. Also, our breaking cadence could be could be attacked through here. We could do something different here. Watch our red lights while we're braking, right? I know the driver's braking because I see this is this is uh, my acceleration, wide open throttle right here. Watch the speed. Look at our braking. So we actually brake too early. Okay, so we know that we overslowed in the middle of the corner based on these two blips right here. Right, and I can also tap the corner at any point to see my instantaneous apex score. So we know we overslowed. So the first thing to attack here is actually going to be back in the corner up, starting with the braking zone, right? This driver actually overslowed in this part of the track, which is why they went back to the power too early right here and why they got back out of it right here before they actually got into the power. I can see all of that from apex score. All right. So they ended up actually not being on the power until after the apex of the corner, or very close to the apex of the corner. In a fast corner, again, we want to shift the weight back towards the rear tires a little bit before the apex. So if this driver wants to achieve, you know, uh, wide open throttle sooner or squeezing back into throttle sooner, I would recommend that they um, actually back up the corner a little bit and they should actually attack the brake pedal a little bit more. Right. And the reason I say that is watch, Watch the braking. So what I mean by attack the brake pedal a little bit more is there's more capacity to either brake, brake later and harder because they're obviously not braking at maximum. And we can tell that pretty easily if we go back to the speed trace because we all we have to do is compare the slope right here. I'm sorry, we'll keep it like this. The slope of this line with the slope of this line and know immediately that's not as steep of a slope as this is. Right, so that's not maximum braking. That's hard brake, release, brake, release, right? So we could probably stand a brake a tad later and then just do all that braking at once and then slowly start to release it. The other thing that we could probably do is if we were able to see the driver's foot on the pedals or something like that, what you would probably see is some indecision with the brakes. And then all of this stems from our vision and where we're looking through the corner. All right. So what I really like to do with data, um, never go to throttle until you can stay in the throttle. Yes. Thank you, Adam. A lot of times we want to get the throttle as early as we can, which is always true. The earlier, the better, the more, the larger percentage of the lap we spend at wide open throttle, the better. But if the difference is, you know, wait another 10th of a second and then commit to throttle and get to wide open throttle, that's always a better option than squeezing the 10% throttle a little bit earlier or getting to wide open throttle and having to get back out of it, right? The whole goal is to get to wide open throttle as soon as possible and leave it there, All right? That's our goal. So this, this speed trace right here should look more, it should be more consistent and more U-shaped, and this minimum corner speed should be shifted back about 50 feet in the corner. Our minimum corner speed should be about right here. That would indicate that um, our trajectory into the corner is better. That would mean that, uh, you know, our braking cadence is working better. That would mean that our line of sight is down the track and that we're able to, to commit the throttle a little bit earlier. So what I would task this driver to do is in review in their next session, go in here and add another session down at the bottom, All right? Add another session in to view their next session. And what that's going to do for us would be allow them to compare the slope of this line in this session that they knew was wrong with the slope of this line in the next session and see how some of these tips were able to help them. But what I like to really do with data and where I was going before I answered that question, where in this corner, I'll get to that in just a second, Eric. Great question. Um, what I, uh, and I kind of lost my train of thought, but, and this, this plateau right here means a slow transition to brake pedal, um, which I think Adam, uh, mentioned earlier that means that they're easing off the gas and easing into the brakes which mean we're not confident and so just through these things that I've talked about spending this amount of time we've only been live for 39 minutes um, and I've only been looking at this corner um, you know in a variety of different ways for the past 15 or so um, I immediately now know that this driver is not confident here and this is a fast corner so the way that we can approach ourselves so if this is me and I know I'm struggling with this issue what I usually struggle from, knowing myself, I have to run this data through the filter of, of Andrew, knowing what I do, right? And then I would have to tell it to myself in terms that make sense. So for me, it would be, hey, back the whole corner up, right? 
try and get the speed trace looking right. Like back the whole corner up. Don't charge it too hard because that's when you scare yourself and you're not able to commit to go back the throttle, right? Try not to worry about your entry speed as much. Get the whole progression of your brake ring and your release of brake. Define your end of brake point and try to define the apex. And then work on your vision and then build up this initial brake point, right? Brake earlier and then start braking what Skip Barber would say is Bebo, break early, break often. If you ever know Bruce McInnes from Skip Barber, he'll tell you that all the time. Break earlier and break often, but but move that breaking point up until you get to the point where this curve, where this is going to be a steeper decrease, it's going to be consistent, and it's going to smooth out as we approach our minimum corner speed, and then it's going to roughly uh, go up further. Now, what we can tell from the apex score, and Eric asked, at what point in this corner, where – where at in the corner is 100% apex score achievable? That's a very good question. 100% um, apex score from the time we apply the brakes until corner exit is actually is actually going to be achievable because that 100% is the end of the red lights, not the end of the transparent lights. Does that make sense? So basically any corner that you're not consistently near 100%, there's room for improvement. There's more grip available. Um, I'm happy to field questions about that, but because that, because Apex is calculating these red lights and not these lights, this is not 100%. This is 100%. That might be something that is worth explaining a little bit more. The end of the red lights are 100%, right? 100% for that situation. Does that make sense? It's kind of open to interpretation a little bit. This would be. Also 100% if the red light's extended there, that would basically be the maximum threshold of grip, like the maximum potential for grip. It would have to be aided by factors other than the tire itself. So let's say this is our maximum on flat, on a flat corner. This is our maximum on a banked corner or an uphill corner, right? That might be a good way to think about it. Does that make sense? I know it's a little, I try to be specific with my wording. I'm a very big picture person, so I apologize if I get, you know, it makes sense in my head, at least. Hopefully you can understand what Baker has to deal with every day, raining me in. He's over here like, yeah, you're crazy, man. No, it's tons of fun. All right, so we really, really dove into turn five, but we can tell just through several different um, analysis points on this corner of the speed trace, and also What's, what we can very clearly do, and again, I'm, I'm taking this in way more detail, but what I would do is just watch your progression of lights through the corner. And if you see a handful of red lights through there, that corner is worth looking at, right? Um, now, something else to consider is your time is valuable. So is this corner, are you losing the most time here or somewhere else? That's why we continue to, to analyze the lap. So now we're going to accelerate exiting the corner here and, and transition again. Our transitions are going to be defined by this kind of uh, constant state, state of acceleration back to a lot of green lights, which is going to be deceleration going downhill. Now what I'm, I'm starting to pick, figure out, and I'm already seeing through this corner right here, everybody see this right here? This driver's tendencies, this is the third corner in a row that we've seen the same similar tendency. Um, yes, Adam, you want to, you do want to see green lights and from the time you're turning the wheel. So, Here's a better way to, to describe it. From the time you add brake input, from the brake zone all the way to track out, um, you at some point, if you're achieving 100% grip, you should be able to see all green lights. Right? You should be able to have all green lights on the device. That means that you're using 100% of the tire. Now, right? It's it's just think about it as another point of reference. Always run, and I tell people this all the time. When you take advice somebody, advice from somebody, someone tells you to do something, um, run it through your own filter before applying it to your life, right? That goes with everything. Um, and by filter, I mean run it through what you need to understand. Just like I said, when and I'm looking at this for myself, I know that my tendency there, if if I'm not carrying, yeah, I know, I know we're going long, but um, we'll probably stop this at 50 minutes or so. I know if I'm not carrying my maximum speed through the corner, that it's probably stems from a vision or a confidence issue. And so those are the two things that I really want to attack. For some people, 
it might just be that you just need to know that more is possible. And if you know more is possible, you can commit. Um, Nicholas, 99% APEX score. So um, a pro driver can definitely get a much higher APEX score. Uh, but, and this is where this comes in, we see all of these red, see the red on the straightaway? The reason the device shows us red on the straightaway is because it does not model shifting as um, maybe I would like for it to or others would. It's just the technology is very sophisticated. Um, and basically when you upshift, you lose acceleration, right? So you, if you uh, were racing against a, a ghost car that didn't have to shift and had seamless torque all the time, it would pull away from you where you see red, right? Um, that's a good way to think about it. Uh, so basically at a state of more constant acceleration, apex score is low. So 100% is not possible on a track where we have straightaways basically, unless your car uh, has seamless acceleration. Um, so basically what we learn is that at certain tracks, there's a range of apex scores that, that are good. Um, and I can tell you from experience at NCM, over an 80% Apex score means that you're hustling pretty good, right? And 85 would be excellent. And at most tracks with about the same percentage of, of time on a straightaway as, as NCM, that's going to be true. 85 at Barber Motorsports Park, totally achievable. 85 at Atlanta Motorsports Park, totally achievable. 85 at Daytona, nope. 65 at Daytona is pretty good. Um, it'll make a lot more sense once we aggregate that information, right, and share it with people. Does that make sense? Ravi, you're welcome for the edumacation. We're all about edumacation here. Um, so what I was getting at by looking at the progression of the lights in this corner, does everyone see that I'm, I'm tapping the lap to see instantaneous apex score right here? All right, does that make sense? So because this driver is, is uh, right, they're using good, good apex score on the way in but they're seeing red lights basically at the apex of the corner or close to it, right? There's a little bit of GPS shift here, right? They might be a little bit closer. We can assume they're probably off the inside curb a little bit. So that would be something to um, address, but because we're seeing this, this decrease in apex score, see again, how we're going to gain apex score on the exit, right? That is problematic. That means that this same tendency we've seen before is that we are, basically checking up a little too early, over slowing and committing back to throttle early. Now this is something I had a problem with and most of us do. So this is, is nothing against this driver. This is probably the first big learning plateau you get to when you're learning, right? When you start to go really fast and you can carry a good corner speed and you can break a little bit later, what starts to happen, right? If you're comfortable getting off the brake and going back to gas, if that happens just a little bit too soon, this is what we see. So all this driver is doing is overslowing a little bit on the entry, right? And they're getting back to throttle a little earlier. So like Adam said earlier, wait until you can commit to full throttle, right? And, I, and I'm a fan of coaching people not to brake later, right? But to start to release the brake sooner. So apply your initial brake in the same place. What I would recommend to this driver, apply the initial brake, maybe in the same place, maybe a bit sooner if it helps you get your line of sight ahead, right? And looking for your exit but then start to release the brake a bit sooner because what we really, really need to consider what apex score really values. Yes. Very natural. This is a super common thing. This is a very, very common problem to diagnose, but the first, uh, the first step in crisis recognition is actually recognizing that there is a crisis, right? So we got to identify it before we can fix it. Now the fix um, from a coaching standpoint is kind of what I was getting into is uh, start to release the brake sooner. Right, start to roll speed into the corner. So apply the brakes in the same place, hard initial brake, right? Hard initial brake, smooth release of the brake, like a ballerina coming off that brake pedal, especially when we've got a lot of steering dialed into the car. Now this is a slow speed corner. This is very, very different. This is something Eric and I spent a lot of time talking about last week. When we're diving into a slow speed corner here, let's see what our minimum corner speed is. I'm gonna move the ticker down. I'm gonna tap the middle of the corner. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm pressing stuff all over the place. I'm going to tap the middle of the corner and I'm going to look for my speed. All right, so somewhere around 45 miles an hour. 
right? So we're under 60 miles an hour for minimum corner speed. So that automatically tells me I'm gonna be carrying some amount of brake into the corner. I'm gonna be trailing at least a little bit of braking into the corner, right? I might not be carrying it all the way to the apex, but on a speed, on a, a corner, I'm sorry, with a speed under 60 miles an hour, I'm going to be trailing the brake towards the apex, right? And that, there's a variety of reasons for that. I'll, I'll basically spare the reasons because uh, I wanted to touch on the previous corner really quickly, but just keep that in mind. Just to go faster here, to get the car turned, to take advantage of weight transfer, we're carrying the brake into the corner. Our end of braking is going to be later in a corner under 60 miles an hour, slow speed corner. Now in a high speed corner, we're gonna release the brake very differently, right? In a high speed corner, we're usually not gonna carry as much brake input into the corner, right? And we're going to release the brake sooner. There's a variety of reasons for that. Again, I'll spare you for that, but just remember, that's another reason why that speed trace looks a little differently. The primary reason behind that is that this corner, 95 mile an hour minimum, minimum corner speed, this corner, 45 mile an hour minimum, 43.8 right there, right? Minimum corner speed. Big difference in the way the chassis handles, big difference in the way how much potential energy is stored in the springs. So without getting too technical, we can do a whole topic on this. As we enter the corner here at 100 plus miles an hour, there's a lot more potential energy. There's a lot more built up energy in the chassis, right? Think about uh, you know, what those front springs are gonna do, how much energy is gonna be applied to the front springs when we hit the brake pedal from 115 miles an hour with much more momentum, right? That's gonna shift that weight forward a lot quicker and a lot more aggressively. That's why we have to get smoothly release that brake pedal. We want to have a very neutral, stabilized platform to carry maximum speed through the corner. All right, so this is all building up to me into reasoning to you why, the, why we approach a faster corner a little bit differently. So we actually want to establish the weight over the rear tires around or before the apex, so committing the throttle around or before the apex in a fast corner. That's going to help us carry the most speed through the corner. And there, there are other factors that affect that, including aerodynamic drag at 95 miles an hour, especially with a car with wings. The, the effects of aero are very, very much so at play. Extreme, extremely at play, okay? 100 miles an hour, right? You ever put your hand out a window at 100 miles an hour? So as soon as you let off the gas pedal at 100 miles an hour, you're slowing down a lot faster than you are at 43 miles an hour, all right? So those are a couple things to take. So, a lot of potential energy pinned up in the springs, a lot more aerodynamic drag and uh, aerodynamic efficiency, all right, or aerodynamic impact, I guess, on the car. Um, the, the combination of those reasons is why we establish throttle or commit to throttle a little bit sooner in the corner. And the last goal, the last like macro way to look at it is to gain the most time on our lap, right? We want to maintain as much speed as we can from entry to exit. All right, the amount of speed or the, the time that we could uh, that we can gain through the corner. We're gonna, basically we're going to gain a lot more time by averaging a higher speed through this part of the track, right? Than treating it like this corner, slowing the car down, getting it pointed, accelerating out. All right, so slow in, fast out in this corner is interesting, right? This is actually an entry corner speed, entry speed, entry speed, an entry speed corner. I don't know how to talk. It's getting late. Uh, so we're focusing, actually, it's almost more important to our lap time to carry higher entry speed than exit speed because we're going to kill all that speed that we gained right here. So from a lap time perspective, this U over here, right, shouldn't look like this. It should be more succinct, and this minimum corner speed should be higher. And the reason I know that is because we see red lights on the Apex device, meaning at our minimum speed in the corner there's red lights that's a whole nother thing that we can talk about right we see these lighter colorings there's two of them right there that immediately tells me that this minimum corner speed could be shifted up all right which means that this needs to be a little bit smoother all right but more time on our lap is going to be gained on entry all right so we've, we've already gone way over what we committed uh, to do and what we usually do on these more motorsports mondays if you would like your data reviewed in the future, please send it to us. We're always up for doing this. 
I hope this is helpful. I hope you're following along with your Apex app. Um, this is uh, super, super helpful. I find it helpful. Every time I look at it, I get more out of it. In the future, we'll go into more depth uh, with speed traces. We can go into more depth with longitudinal and lateral G. We can figure out stuff like understeer and oversteer and how to identify those in the data. We could spend all day talking about braking. Um, we could go into why we want to see a V-shaped uh, speed trace in a slow corner. We could probably spend 30 minutes on that. Um, we could spend a bunch of time on this right here, this little plateau, right at 120 miles an hour. Why are we seeing that? Is that good, bad, and different? It's not good, but we can go into that. Um, also, we can go into other app features. What is this thing, right? Histogram. How do we use this, right? What do we do? What do we do with it? What can we tell from it? When is it most valuable? Um, we can do a lot. Very looking forward to seeing you guys at PRI as well. Um, if you do not have the Apex app, I definitely urge you to download it. Um, also, the Apex Pro hardware is uh, super important. Get a 10 hertz GPS, 9-axis IMU, the stuff that you need to record data that looks like this, right? You're not gonna get this consistency of data with your smartphone. It's just not gonna happen. You can only do some rudimentary stuff with your smartphone. Um, you're certainly not gonna get this kind of information and this, uh, this interface with, with another system. I'm a big fan of how simple the interface is. As always, if you have thoughts, comments, questions, other, please let us know. All right, guys, thank you very much. Sorry, I couldn't end it. <laughs>